Oh, we'll be joined now uh, from Paris by Jorge Castaneda, uh, who is there. And are, are you in Paris for anything having to do with Mexico, Jorge? Yes. Hi, Charlie. Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm uh, uh, a part of the, uh, President Peña Nieto's uh, delegation to, on his official visit to France uh, as uh, the co-president, co-chairman of the Franco-Mexican Strategic Council. So that's why I'm here. Uh, what is the president saying uh, to you and to people in his official entourage about this? And I mean, how he, ca he calls it unpardonable, but uh, everybody is stunned around the world that the president of Mexico would allow this to happen. Charlie, I, I haven't had the chance to speak with the president, but certainly with people in his delegation, what I can more convey to you, I guess, and to our viewers is uh, they, they all feel dazed. It's as if they've been, you know, hit by a train or something, uh, and they really just don't know exactly what's going on. You have to recall this is an important visit for, a visit for Peña Nieto to France. We had a lot of difficulties with France in the recent past. They've been patched up. It's a big deal. He's going to be the only guest at the 14th of July or Bastille Day parade uh, on the Champs Elysees. So it's a big deal for Mexico. And now everybody's talking about Chapo. Nobody's talking about Peña Nieto, other to say that what an embarrassment this is and what uh, how how absolutely incredible the whole story seems to be. So it really is perhaps the most difficult moment of his administration so far. Now he has a way of accumulating difficult moments. So maybe six months from now we'll have another one. Uh, what will it do to his popularity in Mexico? Uh, it, unless they recapture Chapo Guzman very quickly, Charlie, I think this is going to be devastating, even though his popularity is already very, very low. It's the lowest right. popularity of any Mexican president since Cedillo in early 95, and that was because of an economic crisis. So uh, this is not going to be good because nobody believes that he's being torn apart in the social media uh, by people making fun of the tunnel, making fun of Saturday night, you know, at the movies or the equivalent in Mexico, um, making fun of where is he? He's in Paris while Chapo is, uh, you know, has flown to Guatemala now or maybe Chapo will show up in Paris. And it's, it's really very sad because in a way, President Peña Nieto is not directly responsible for this. The guy is an escape artist. They should have been more careful, but it's hard to blame the president directly for having either allowed this or having even in many any way being complicit with it. But there is negligence involved, not on the part just of the people in the jail. There's negligence on the part of the highest levels of government in Mexico. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Okay, let me come back um, to you, Don, because you do have to go. I mean, so here, here is a former foreign minister saying, well, he's not, the president's not responsible. Um, but it happened on his watch. And my interest is also, is there simply having everything to do with drug cartels, a culture of money and corruption that in some ways makes this predictable, as we talked about earlier? Well, I'm afraid there is. And, you know, the Sinaloa cartel has had members of the police and high-ranking members in the government in their pocket for years and years. So this took a lot of coordination. It took a lot of communication. It took a lot of help from the inside and the outside. And so uh, money often is the answer to that or intimidation. Uh, Patrick, why is he so skilled at, at being a drug cartel drug lord is he different from the other drug lords does he have a better organization is he is he more violent is he smarter is he what uh, most most of the above he um, I mean this is a guy interestingly who grew up a farm boy uh, in the mountains of Sinaloa and uh, left school in the third grade um, he's more or less illiterate from from what we understand. He has about a third grade reading level. He does uh, he does text on a BlackBerry with people, so he, he does read and write a little bit. Um, and he he rose to to prominence in the 70s and 80s. Um, but then really, it was actually after he escaped from prison the last time in 2001 that he really came into his own. There are a bunch of aspects of the Sinaloa cartel that that make it stand out from the others one of which is that it's um it's horizontally uh integrated if you like it's it's a it's quite diversified um they uh they move cocaine uh heroin methamphetamine and marijuana across the border in terms of violence uh this is a very violent organization i mean i i to to Jorge's point about 
uh, all the levity um, on social media about this. I, you know, it's I can understand it, but um, it saddens me a little bit that this is such a big punchline because you realize this is a, a guy and an organization that is responsible for tens of thousands of deaths in Mexico, and I think that we can lose sight of that. And 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 to me, that's it's you know it's the it's the tragedy. Um, of him escaping justice this time. But I think also for Mexico, it's a real reckoning because it says something about the rule of law in the country if a man who is responsible for that magnitude of suffering uh, can go free. Back to you, Jorge. When you, you, we all come back to the notion that somehow uh, this is the way it is in Mexico, uh, that there is a corruption when it comes to drugs uh, that is so deep and so broad that this is inevitable. I think we, maybe we should split it in, in, in two in a way, Charlie. The, cor the corruption and the drug trade and the absence of the rule of law in Mexico are deep, broad, wide, intense. Whatever adjective you want to use is, I think, accurate. <laughs> Whichever one, you can take your pick. Now, that being the case, it does not necessarily imply that this guy... Three day, two days ago, had to escape, that it was impossible to avoid his escape from that prison two days ago. The government was clearly remiss in that sense. They were not watching out. They were not doing their homework. These are two different issues. There's a whole bunch of guys in Mexico who are in jail and who, don't, who do not escape from jail every day, on the one hand. On the other hand, there has always been an antidote for this. It's not great, but it, it works, which is to extradite these guys to the United States. But not a year and a half later, but right away. It's uh, humiliating for Mexican sovereignty, granted. Uh, it, makes, it allows the United States government to know a bunch of stuff about what Chapo would have told them about his accomplices in the Mexican government. It makes it more difficult for the Mexican government to be able to interrogate him freely once he's in the U.S. All of these are downsides of extradition. Compared to whom or to what? Well, compared to his having escaped from jail uh, on Saturday night. So maybe there there was a mistake that was made by the government by not extraditing him right away. Or maybe they made a bigger mistake, which is to now, in the last few weeks, to have begun to threaten or advertise the fact that they were going to extradite him. And so he went to his plan B, using the tunnel which he had, but did not necessarily want to use. But once he found out that they were about to send ship him up to the United States and say, well, then I'm going to use the tunnel. So, you know, I think it's a terrible situation for Mexico, but it's more a reflection of a general context than something that was inevitable in itself. I read Patrick's excellent piece in The New Yorker this morning. Uh, you know, I, I agree with it entirely, except maybe for that last point that it was absolutely inevitable. Predictable, perhaps, inevitable, I'm not sure. Patrick? Yeah, I'd make two points. I mean, first of all, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I was saying it was, uh, it was inevitable. On the contrary, I actually think that Mexico um, could have taken steps to make sure that, uh, that Chapa was secured. I, the, the two quick points I would make is, to your point about extradition, it's fascinating, the timing, because the last time Chapo escaped from prison in 2001, he had actually at that point been in prison for years, and extradition papers were, were getting ready to have him sent to the United States. It was at the point where they were going to ship him to the United States that he broke out the last time, which is an interesting question. Uh, in this particular instance, after he was captured last February, there's been a big fight between the United States and Mexico. Chapo was indicted in, I think, six or eight different jurisdictions across the United States. And federal prosecutors here were essentially saying, look, we don't, you know, after what happened last time, we don't know that we trust you guys to hold him. You need to get him to us here. And I spoke with a bunch of Mexican officials over the past uh, 16 months or so who had said, no, no, look, we can do this. This is actually a test case for the rule of law in Mexico. It's important for sovereignty reasons that we hold on to this guy. And I think in fairness to them, they said, you know, we caught him. Uh, and the bulk of, of his crime took place in our country. We're the ones who have the casualties to show for it. So he should face justice here. The last thing I just wanted to quickly say, Charlie, to your question about um, whether there's something about the drug trade in Mexico that does make it inevitable, is that something that I think often gets lost when we talk about the war on drugs in this country, specifically with reference to Mexico, 
uh, is that a lot of the murders don't happen on this side of the border, but we are very much a part of this. We are very much tied into it. It is a cross-border market, right? So we're the demand, okay? It's because of our prohibition that this business exists at all and that it's so lucrative. So, Jorge, what do you think is going to happen now? Two things, Charlie. I, I, one, what I think will happen, one I hope would happen. What will happen, I think, is when the president returns to Mexico, some heads will roll, even if they catch him soon, because this has been so embarrassing, so humiliating for Mexico and for the president that some heads have to roll. Now, what I hope would happen, Charlie, following Patrick's point, but perhaps going a little further, is that it's time for Mexico to tell the United States, guys, we're done. We're not going to do this anymore, okay? If you want to stop the drugs entering the United States, you do it on your side of the border. We're not going to put up any checkpoints on the highways anymore. We're not going to carry out drug busts. We're not going to go after the cartel leaders. We're going to ver de facto or even de jure legalize drugs in Mexico. And you guys figure out what you want to do. But we've had enough. 100,000 dead in the last nine years, over 30,000 people who are missing, an enormous amount of money that's been spent on this, the humiliation of escapes like these, the f more serious humiliation of widespread human rights violations in Mexico by the army, by the navy, by the police, and of course by the drug cartels also, but they're not... Uh, part of the Mexican state. This is something which has become absurd, especially as more and more states in the United States legalize marijuana now. What is the point of having people like Chapo in jail and devoting enormous resources to getting them in jail and keeping them in jail and then having them escape anyway if once they get their merchandise into the United States, it's legal? Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.